briefly, this is just a little snippet about Dr. Golden. He is an associate professor of teaching at Drew Theological School in Drew University's Center on Religion, Culture, and Conflict. He is the director of the Conflict Resolution and Leadership Certificate Program. His resume begins by stating that he aspires to educate the next generation of leaders in interfaith and intercultural understanding. There is much more to say about Jonathan, but I just want to welcome him and let him take over. Thank you, Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, and it is such an honor to be here. And um, yeah, I, I'd like to think I'm an old friend of the church, so I, on autopilot, drove to the other building this morning, because that's where Ram has had some of his meetings in the past. But um, I'd like to think I'm an old friend of the community, so thank you so much for having me and for inviting me, and for such an important um, you know, time and, and topic in particular. Um, so there's, there's, there is a lot to talk about, but I also hope to have this as a conversation and, and engaging, um, you know, with you all. And um, I guess a few, you know, it's so, there's so much, so I, I actually was hard, had a hard time even deciding like where to begin. Um, one of the things, I, I, I thought the email that went out to the community, um, I think it was on Friday, um, was really lovely, and some of what it captured, I think I even copied some of it. Um, I have it here somewhere in my notes. But one of the things that I thought, um, so yeah, it, I'll, I'm going to read that. Recording I, in progress. I, I really love that. Um, it's hard not to ponder the long-running historical dance between religious belief and conflict, violent and non-conflict. How can we account for this? What, if anything, can we do to once and for all um, uncouple the two? And how can we as people of faith contribute to a world in which religion actually lessens conflict? And, um, you know, I would actually just take it one minor step further and say, um, what role can religion play in resolving conflict? Because here, here's like one of the most common questions that I get, right, when people hear what I do, my job at you know, I direct the Center on Religion, Culture, and Conflict at Drew. I convene our conflict resolution program. I teach in the theological school at Drew. So you can imagine I'm at any cocktail party or even at a Yankee game and you run into somebody. And, <laughs> and, and the first kind of go-to is um, very often, um, well, isn't religion the cause of conflict, right, around the world? We look at all these conflicts, you know, the most obvious one that we just can't get away from is Israel, Palestine, what's happening in Gaza. Um, but you know, we look to South Asia and multiple parts of South Asia, there is extreme interreligious conflict that is happening. If we look in the, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, Nigeria, right? Um, it is Christians and Muslims. It is around the world. There is conflict that seems to be driven and, and you know, it's, it's, I, I like being in a community like this because um, I can sort of say that often when I'm in, you know, not uncommon to be on a college campus where you have a very secular community that are almost like anti-religious in some cases. Um, and so the, the, the next thing that I frequently get is like, well, if we didn't have religion, right, would we, couldn't we get rid of all this conflict and of course, the first thing I like to remind people is, like, well, why don't we start naming some of the famous peace builders that you've heard of, right? And if you start going down the list, um, right, um, Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, like, if, you know, if you start, Desmond Tutu, if you start naming the people that were prominent figures in resolving these conflicts, they are always religious figures, almost always religious figures. Um, I, I should mention my good friend now, the Reverend Harold Good, who played such a critical role in the um, Northern Irish conflict. Um, and so, um, this is one of the, the pieces that people sort of overlook, and something that I've been really trying to, you know, kind of bring back into, at least into the non-religious world, because I think the religious kind of communities 
of our world, people already know this, right? People are aware of this. And um, one of the pioneers in the field of conflict resolution is John Paul Later out of Mennonite, and the Mennonite, a great, great tradition. Um, but also, here's the other thing I teach a class called um, World Wisdom for Conflict Resolution Cross Cultural Approaches, right? This idea, because also is very important to me that people don't think that we invented conflict resolution in the West either, right? You can go to any religious tradition, any, um, any, any tribe anywhere in the world, and you will find that over time they have all developed internal mechanisms for resolving conflict, right? You can imagine that if you were in you know, the middle of, of, of the bush in Congo, um, or in you know Malaysia, they're not gonna say, well, you know, oh, what what are those guys in you know Europe or North America saying? They've got their own internal system that they use. And so much of that wisdom actually comes from the religious tradition. So I was really excited to, in preparing for this over the past few weeks, um, read a little into um, some of the great traditions within the Presbyterian Church for peace building and what an important element it is. Um, so, in particular, Lectio Divina, um, or Lectio, I guess many people pronounce it locally, but you know, in, the, in Latin, um, and it's really fascinating because so this is this is the learning, um, listening, um, right, open, heartfelt listening to Scripture um, and allowing God to speak to us directly from the Scripture. Um, and then other elements of it, the, the other steps, meditatio, reflecting on the word, oratio, responding to the word, and contemplatio, um, resting in the, in the word of God, right? Allowing it to sit with us. And that's in some ways the, one of the harder but most important steps in all this because it's not so hard to come, I don't know, maybe for some to, I don't always get up at 7.30 on a Sunday morning, so, but to come to a space, right, where you can sit and, and talk about this and have a piece of scripture in front of you um, and read together, um, and in that space, wow, what a great lesson, and then you walk out and five minutes later there's somebody, you know, cutting you off in traffic or cutting in front of you in the line in the shop right and like your instinct to, right, to respond in, in a way that like five minutes ago in church, you were like, oh, I would never respond like that. <laughs> <laughs> and so, right, so like, how do we carry that, you know, the message, right, and that feeling with us at all times? And that's, you know, that comes with the meditation part and really, really internalizing it, right, which is something that was so strongly emphasized um, within the, the writings, um, you know, from the Presbyterian Church. There was a really lovely piece, um, and I'm sorry, some of you may be very aware of this, but as I was researching, and it's great because this kind of adds to my, you know, fuller understanding of religious traditions um, in, you know, around the world and conflict resolution. So there was a piece written, The Spiritual and Practical Aspects of Negotiation of Church Conflict, which came from the Office of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church. And it talks about laying the spiritual groundwork. Um, and then I quote, I have become increasingly aware that in times such as this, we cannot simply be a people of great resources and information. We must also be a people of great transformation. Mm -hmm. Right? And this is, so I'll be frank with you, in our program, we actually named it conflict resolution because that is the term that most people are familiar with. But actually what we try to practice is conflict transformation. Anyone think they know the difference between conflict resolution or conflict transformation? And maybe even a, an earlier stage of it, which is conflict management, right? So that is just like in the immediate moment, how do we make this fight go away, right? And you know, often like if it's two kids in the school, we are just separate. Right? Let's get Billy and Bobby tugging them apart, sit them in other corners of the room, and it's over for now. Um, conflict resolution might, you know, have them come together, you know, sit and apologize and say what they did wrong, and, and that would be conflict resolution. Conflict transformation would be, let's really talk to Billy and Bobby and find out what really drove that conflict, because the problem with conflict resolution in and of itself is that, if you don't really get deeper into the root 
views of, of what's at stake and what is driving the conflict in the first place, it's going to come back tomorrow. The same conditions that contributed to the conflict are going to be there um, um, all, you know, are perpetuated, perpetually. And so um, this idea that we transform the conflict by transforming the conditions that created the conflict in the, in the first place. Right? So this, of course, means a lot more than, than reading something on a Sunday morning um, and then just failing to carry that message forward with you, right? So internalizing the message um, and, and laying that spiritual groundwork, right, that you need to carry with you. Um, and then, of course, having the, the fortitude, the endurance, the tenacity to uh, a good friend of mine who I, I teach with, he teaches in our program, Donald likes to say, staying in the crucible, right? Because our tendency also is things get a little hot and you're just like, you know, I, I just need to remove myself from this and I'll come back when I'm not so hot anymore, right? And then, but you did nothing to actually address the conflict whatsoever, right? So that, how do we really dig deep in, um, we use a, a, an iceberg diagram where you've got, you know, certain things that are at the very surface and things that are at the much, much deeper level, deep beneath the surface. And I, I will, maybe next time, next week, I'll, I'll, I'll bring an image so I can show you this, but you've got two overlapping triangles, um, which really shows you that at the deepest, deepest root, we're more likely to find common ground, right? And more likely to, so it's a different <laughs> expression, a different approach, a different understanding in, in practical ways of how to get there, but the there that we're all trying to get to so frequently, you know, overlaps. Um, and so um, I thought that actually, if it's okay, one of the first things I might do is um, jump right in with a, um, a piece um, from, from the, um, the Hebrew Bible, um, from the book of Genesis. And it's actually really nice timing because, so last week, or a week and a half ago, I guess it was, was Rosh Hashanah. Um, and I read in my synagogue, I read from the Torah, um, and that is nerve wracking because we got the Hebrew perfect the vowels, and the, the melody, and, and all of that. Um, and, um, but it's very funny that the piece that um, last year the cantor had asked me to read um, randomly was a piece that I had once written an article. Um, and it's also, uh, the other tradition within Judaism is, you know, you read the Torah, you read a weekly piece, um, and then we are now literally in the holiday of Sukkot right now, the festival of booths and in-gathering, I can say a lot more about it, Sukkot is my favorite holiday, actually. Um, we were out in my sukkah, you know, while the Yankees were playing the <laughs> we were in sukkah last night. Um, but, um, but, um, so, so you, the end of this week, though, will be uh, another holiday called Simchat Torah, where you celebrate the Torah, uh, and it's because you have finished the year's round of weekly readings, and so on that day, it's really fun, you, you save the very, very last piece for that evening, and then the very, very first piece for that evening, right? So you read the very last, you know, passages of the Torah, you dance with the Torah um, around the sanctuary and so forth, and then you immediately start reading it again. And it's really cool, you're like, okay, here we go, we're gonna read it all over again. And um, so this reading from Genesis will also be coming up very, very um, soon. But I'd like to, so in the spirit of Lectio Divina, like, and, and sitting with scripture and learning from it, um, I'm gonna read this piece, um, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with it anyway. Um, and then we can talk a little bit about what it, what it means to us, what, what kind of resonates with you. So two questions, and, and again, this is coming from this tradition, um, which is, um, so first, sit with it for a, a moment, and what was it, um, what stood out to you most, and what you know, resonates with you, and then the next sort of step is a slightly deeper analytical level of um, how does that apply to my life? And is it a, um, 
you know, a conflict that I'm experiencing in the moment? Is it a conflict on the other side of the world that's concerning me? Is it, you know, of course, right, we all know we are now um, just over two Tuesday will be two weeks from an election which has many of us on edge and really, I want to add one thought, by the way, before. Um, I went with my family last, two weekends ago, to Easton, Pennsylvania, to like the battleground of battleground states to go canvassing, um, door to door, knocking on doors, and we were given a list of Democrats, Republicans, Independents, doors to knock on. And if you're listening to social media or the news, they will, you will be terrified of whoever you perceive to be on the other side, right? Oh my God, I'm knocking on a Trump door. Oh my God, I'm knocking on a Kamala door. Um, and, and, it, and it's really, really, they, they scare you with what to expect. That was not our experience. Granted, I had an adorable little four-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> so that helps a lot. <laughs> But we knocked on doors and people, you know, and it would be really funny. And so we'll come and I'd say, you know, can we, you know, can we talk about the issues? Um, you know, and of course it's probably funny to them, someone like me coming. Like, let's have a nice, you know, interactive conversation, right? To try to understand one another. Um, maybe that's not what they, you know, typically are accustomed to. Um, but the number of people... Um, everyone was civil, everyone was kind, everyone was inviting. People literally came, you know, you come to the storm door and you're pretty sure no one's gonna, you know, pass that force field, right? Like, <laughs> um, the number of people that opened that storm door came out onto the stoop and just chatted with us, regardless of what they thought, was really, really remarkable. So I just want to actually add a little bit of optimism and share some encouragement that maybe it's not quite as bad as it might, as the media and social media might have us actually believe. Um, so anyway, I'm gonna read this piece. Um, at that time, so it's from, it's um, Genesis 22. And so uh, the other story that we read on Yom Kippur of Hagar and Isaac and Abraham has just happened. And that's a really powerful story as well. Now we're at the story where um, Abraham is meeting the Philistine king. And just by the way, because I also do some, I, I've written some books on archeological research and ancient history. This is a real um, anachronism. When Abraham was living in the south of what is today Israel, there were no Philistines there yet. So you probably didn't really encounter the Philistines, but nonetheless, um, in Genesis, he has this interaction with Abimelech, um, the king of the of the um, of Gerar of, of a Philistine city and Fichol, the commander of his army. At that time, Abimelech and Fichol, the commander of his army, said to Abraham, "God is with you in all that you do. Now, therefore, swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me, or with my descendants, or with my posterity. But as I have dealt kindly with you." So you will deal with me and with the land where you have sojourned. And Abraham said, I will swear. When Abraham approved Abimelech, reproved Abimelech about a well of water. So just, by the way, I'm sorry, extra context that you need is also previously had been the story where it's, an, it's a very, another really interesting biblical passage that we can unpack in many ways. Abraham had told a little bit of a fib, if you recall. He told, he said that Sarah was his sister, right? And the custom was, in his mind, um, he's terrified that if it's just his wife and he's in this, in, not just, but if it's his wife in this foreign land, they actually might kill him and take his, his wife. Um, but when he says it's his sister, then the king summons her, right? Um, and that's also equally terrifying. And... Um, so God intervenes with a very heavy hand. He goes to the Philistine king in his dreams and, and scares the heck out of him. He says, you know, you will die, like, if you do this. And um, there's actually, in the Islamic version of it, he sort of stiffens the king's hand so that the king literally, physically can't, you know, do anything with, with 
et cetera, to make sure that you know, no adultery like this takes place. But Abraham is, is thinking, actually, I'm entering into a society where adultery is a worse crime than murder. So I'm more worried that, like, in other words, my better play is to say it's my sister, I won't get killed, and, right, and, and though, so, when Abraham is now, so they're at this point where they're trying to make peace at the well, and they just, Abraham swears to him that he will deal kindly with him, that he will respect it, and going forward to posterity as well, which is also really important, right? A peace agreement, any sort of resolution ought to be sustainable, right? We're not trying to resolve it today, we're trying to keep it going. So when Abraham reproved Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized, Abraham said, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me. Abimelech said, I do not know who had done this thing. You did not tell me. And I have not heard of it until today. So Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech. And the two men made a covenant. Abraham set seven ewe lambs on the flock apart. And Abimelech said to Abraham, what is the meaning of the seven lambs that you have set apart? He said, these seven lambs you will take from my hand, that this may be a witness for me that I dug this well. Therefore, that place was called Beersheba, seven wells, because there both of them swore an oath. So they made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech and Fethel, the commander of his army, rose up and returned to the land of the Philistines. And Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God, and Abraham sojourned many days in the land of the Philistines. So let's just think for one minute and think, you know, what sort of what was there a piece of that story that resonated with you, that stood out with you, that might stay with you? No, that's beautiful. Um, absolutely. I mean, this is a big theme. Um, going back earlier is when Abraham will receive strangers, right, in his tent. And so this becomes yet another precedent. I mean, you know, as you already heard, I'm involved with RAMP, which is a, a refugee resettlement agency. I work with the International Rescue Committee, and it's in virtually every faith tradition in the world, this ethic of welcoming the stranger um, you know, ingratiating them into your community, and that's a really, really powerful. Plus, the term sojourn is great, and we don't use it enough, right? Mm -hmm. We often we sojourn, but no one uses that in vernacular English anymore. So, very nice. Thank you. What else? One of the things that uh, struck me was the trust of the words, which I think is you know, in the covenant, they, they trust in each other, which I think is lacking both mentally and spiritually. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful, right? They named the place and they got the lambs, and these are sort of symbols that will remind them. But at the end of the day, really, their covenant is just two men shaking hands and, and agreeing, absolutely. And, and another really interesting part of it is that, you know, they're not quite equals, of course, right? I mean, we, in our minds, elevate Abraham because he's one of the great patriarchs and the founder of, you know, uh, one of the founding members of three of the world's great faiths, um, right? Um, but um, he is not on the level of a king, right? Maybe at this point he's a wealthy, you know, um, owner of flocks and whatnot. He's built a little bit of wealth, um, but he is not a king, right? And so this is very important when we enter into negotiations. How do we level the playing field? How do we deal with power and dynamics, right? Because that doesn't seem to be there. And as a matter of fact, and I'm glad you said that, because that, because one of the most important standouts to me, there's a leveling, um, that takes place in the very first phrase of this um, passage um, that in some ways reminds us who's really the king, right, uh, in all of this. So I'll read that first passage again. 
At the time, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, said to Abraham, God is with you in all that you do. Right? That's so powerful. And that, to me, um, speaks to, you know, one of the first things that I said earlier already, right? Which is like, how do we carry the message out of this room with us? You know, I I'm hoping that all, everyone will learn a little something about conflict resolution um, and negotiation, like here in this space today. But like, what? How can we potentially allow that to really seep into our hearts and souls, so that when someone cuts us off in the parking lot, you know, 20 minutes from now, we'll just remember, you know, um, how we respond to that. And I'll share with you. It's really funny because I so I was asked to write um, a piece about this, and I'll, I'll explain the context of that in a moment because it's another kind of interesting story. Um, but, um, so I'm kind of bringing my conflict resolution like practice skills, right? How can we, so things that you guys already said, right? About um, recognizing the space and who is there and who is coming to the table under what, uh, under what circumstances, right? How do we memorialize the agreements, right? And all the sort of practical elements that are in there. Um, and like anything that I do that goes anywhere near, you know, the Torah, I send it to my brother, the rabbi, to have a look at it. Right? <laughs> and so I had written about, and then the other thing that I'm going to come back to, which is in some ways the, the biggest takeaway, but actually the title of my piece, which is called The Deep Roots of the Tamarisk. And so why he plants a tamarisk tree, and what's the symbolism of that? You know, as we know, like with, with, with the, any of the testaments of the scripture, um, sometimes things seem kind of random. Why was it not a willow tree? Why was it not an acacia tree, which would be indigenous to the area, or a sycamore, right? I mean, it could have been any tree. And believe me, they, you know, every word, right, as we know, divine word is very, very specific. So why was it a, a tamarisk? Um, but anyway, I sent this to my brother, and I'm, I'm focused on all the practical elements. He's like, this is awesome. You've missed one thing, you know? And I'm like, what was that? And I had completely kind of just gone right past that God is with you in all that you do. And I was like, wow, like how did I, you know, I just kind of overlooked that part. And what was great is how I learned that by consulting with my brother, then it framed it in such a way that I really then meditated on that piece. And in some ways, this is something that has lived with me ever since. Um, right, because of course we know God was with Abraham, right? Um, he's you know, um, one of the, perhaps the first prophet, right? Um, um, and, but, but how can we really extract from that, that, you know, that we want to always walk with God is with us no matter what we, we do, right? And that, 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 that Abraham, that God was, was with Abraham, and that a, a Philistine king, who doesn't worship the same God, doesn't subscribe to the same religious views, who recognizes that in him, right? So there's also a great interfaith message there, and multiple paths to God and so forth, and that people coming from the other side of the world will have other sort of messages and things that are inspiring them, but at the end of the day, this idea that there's a divine spirit potentially in all of us, um, and if we carry that, you know, with us, we can carry these other messages and that people will recognize it, right? So I like to think I'm coming to a, a, a table and, and literally happens all the time, right? Again, we're, we're in this space today, but tomorrow morning, most of us are gonna be in the workplace or in whatever our daily business is. Um, and how do we remember to maybe just go beyond the same old sort of habits, right, that we have that might put us in conflict or fail, you know, allow us to fail to see what is driving the other person on the other side of that, right? So, um, in a, you know, we're literally right now at Drew scheduling our classes for the spring, and I get a really anxious email from a colleague, how dare you schedule your class at the same time as mine? And yes, that's the kind of conflicts that I sometimes have to deal with in the workplace. Um, in my field, and um, and so what can I do, how can I carry myself, how can I enter into that space 
and have this person think, even if it's not what's in their mind, God is with this person, literally. Um, just to recognize that, you know, they see you coming into the space with a certain level of dignity, with a, spur a certain level of spiritual elevation, with a spur certain level of, of, of commanding respect because you're giving respect, right? These are all critical, critical elements in entering sort of conflict spaces. Um, and so that was such a, a powerful, you know, standout moment in this story for me, that God is with you in all you do. And so in entering the space of negotiation, that's going to be really powerful. If someone is recognizing you, and remember, like, this is in some ways an opposition to God took the really heavy hand, right? I mean, it was kind of sneaky to go inside the Philistine king's dreams and terrify him. You know, if you do this, you will die, and all of your family and your house will, you know, and evil will be visited upon you. And so just that heavy-handed, you better, you know, cave on this, or terrible things are going to happen to you, rather than Abraham entering this space sort of humbly, and that the, this king is recognizing him as an equal, someone he can negotiate with, and someone that he should treat with gravitas, right, like and take seriously. Um, and so, and just any other elements, though, from this story um, that strike you? Yeah. Um, I hadn't thought of Abraham, uh, that Abraham's role in resolving the conflict. Um, and it's interesting that in our usual approach to Abraham, he's a figure from God. He brings God's message to us. But I don't think of him at least as a resolver of conflict. So it's interesting that he appears in that scriptural passage, in that role. It also reminds me that in the Arab culture at the time of Muhammad, the chieftain's primary responsibility was to resolve conflict. And that's why, one of the reasons why Muhammad was invited to Mecca to Medina to resolve conflict. So what that tells me, thank you for sharing that, is that one of the principal role, responsibilities of religion, is that very thing, to resolve conflict. And it, it finds itself in not just Judaism, or Christianity, but Islam, and probably other religions about which I'm not very familiar. So that was a, was a nice message, a nice passage, thank you for sharing. It helped me understand better what Abraham represents to us. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I mean, great to, to bring so many different traditions into it, but also, you know, I'll tell you a funny story that when we announced, maybe it's almost 10 years now, um, that we were starting a conflict resolution program at Drew, and we just kind of sent it out there into the world of students and alum and parents and all that, the largest response that we got was actually from our theological school alumni, who had said, mm -hmm. Drew Theo School is amazing. It prepared me for virtually everything I need in my practice, except one of the most important things, which is to how to resolve conflict, how to negotiate, how to manage my congregation. Right? I mean, we have, um, you know. So this is this will kind of where I, I want to go with this to kind of name some of the various conflicts that we see. I mean, they might be you know conflict with a, a big C. And I actually, over the past few years, and last year in particular, right, uh, literally all, almost a year going back to October 7, have been invited to come into religious spaces where, you know, I get a, 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 a pastor or a rabbi or in some cases an interfaith council and calling me like, you know, we thought we were a really strong unit with really strong ties and really strong bonds and we are falling apart right now in the worst way because of the way people are arguing over what is happening in the, in the Middle East, right? Because particularly, um, there's an emotional attachment for, for people, right? Um, particularly in the, you know, the, what we call the Abrahamic traditions, right? Um, and so people, family there, people who just because of their faith feel particularly connected to one side or the other, or whatever, right? So really, but not just, so that's conflict with like a big C, big political conflict. But what about the conflicts that are happening within our communities, right? And they may be um, specifically about things that are happening within the church. Um, 
I understand there's some conflict around like church property, right? Um, you know, within the Presbyterian Church or the Methodist Church, it's got to do with some of the same sex issues have been sort of tearing the church, you know, apart from within. Um, so maybe that's like a middle C. Um, and then, of course, just like, you know, you've got a, a family and uh, the son is doing this and please help me with it. Or, you know, a couple is fighting or there's two factions within the community for whatever reason they're fighting with one another. Um, and, and, and it is frequently they will come to the pastor, the reverend, the rabbi, the imam, because that is a sort of natural figure that you would go to. And they're like, oh, I didn't really, I never got trained in this type of work, um, right? Because it's one thing to sort of be that role as shepherd, right? Um, but remember, the shepherd is kind of steering the herd one way or another. If two sheep or goat are fighting with one another, that isn't necessarily what the, the shepherd has been trained for. And so, um, so that that is, it was very interesting to get that message back. And again, emphasizing, you know, reaffirming one of the first things that I've said this morning, right, which is that the role of religious leaders and religious folk um, in conflict resolution. Um, so thank you for, you know, for sharing that as well. Um, anything else that you want to, yeah, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm struck by what you read. What came to me was candor mm. and vulnerability. <coughs> awesome. With that, because think of what, not to be a word, but what sometimes <coughs> of candor is like duplicity yeah, or see. not being mission straight. And vulnerability is like to put yourself at, be willing to put yourself at risk. That's all. Amazing. And both parties. Right? Because think, Abi Mella, he's this Philistine king. He's got the commander of his army standing next to him. He could just end Abraham right there with zero repercussions, right? Um, I mean, he's got all the power in the world in that moment. But he himself is vulnerable. He, you know, because that's why I kind of gave you the extra context that isn't, I mean, I want to read the entire book of Genesis. Right? <laughs> but the context right there where, because he was very upset, he's like, you know, bro, I almost slept with your wife because you deceived me, right? Because of that, like, that would have been horrible to me. I would have inadvertently committed something that is a great, great sin to me. More, you know, as Abraham knows, more sinful than, than murder in their society, right? So he's like, how could you do that to me, right? And so he's being vulnerable, not just like, how dare you, and okay, now I'm going to punish you for it, but let's discuss this because you really put me in a very, very precarious position. And another really interesting element of the story is that Abraham, come, it almost seems like last minute, 11th hour, and they're here to resolve that issue over, you know, Sarah. And now he's like, oh, by the way, some of your men, you know, were stealing water <clears throat> from my well. And Abimelech could have been like, well, why are you bringing that up now? And that's a really, from the conflict resolution, from the real practical side, interesting, you know, part that we could sort of unpack. When you raise those issues, some might be, well, why do you gotta bring up old stuff now? But as we're getting at, right, if you really wanna resolve the deep conflict, let's just get it all. Once we're in a place where we feel comfortable, we're vulnerable, we're open, we're honest, let's get it all out of there and, and deal with all of these issues that are underneath the surface, you know, at once, right? How do we bring it all um, into the open and, and naming the problem, right, right there? So that's a really interesting element of it as well, right? That, that Abraham is now also bringing up this other issue, and Abimelech responds, um, this is the first that I've heard of it. So Abraham might be sitting there the whole time, oh, that, you know, that king came and thinks he can take whatever he wants, he came to my well and, and took this and whatever, and Abimelech is like, I never heard of this before. So this, more than anything, speaks to the fact of, like, let's not make all of these assumptions of what people do and don't know. 
I guarantee if you leave here today and maybe start doing like a reel in your head over some of the conflicts that you've experienced interpersonal, your sister, your brother, your child, your parent, your coworker, um, you might remember, you know, yeah, because I, I didn't know that they didn't know, right? Like I was assuming they don't understand why I'm doing this, why I come to work or whatever into this space this way every day. But actually, so much goes unsaid and unspoken. We don't really take the time to burrow down into the deeper roots and understand what might be driving somebody, right? So we've got all of that right here in the story. And then so the last thing I'll say about the story um, is back to the tamarisk. So the, what is unique about a tamarisk tree is the deep, deep, deep roots. And this is why it's, a, it's, it's, um, it frequently will grow in more arid environments because it grows these very deep roots that can actually, in some cases, reach down to the aquifer. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it doesn't count on rainfall just coming and, and um, um, you know, watering the surface, but it can draw water and wisdom, if you will, from deep, deep in the ground. And of course, it's the soil. Right? So in other words, you trace the root, but then you really want to understand, well, what is that root drinking? So let's understand the soil, the context, right, in which, uh, you know, where those roots are, are drawing from. Um, and of course, so, if, so frequently, you know, when we think about conflict, and, and in some ways this is um, the, the symbol of, of this particular tree is a powerful symbol for, like, understanding our our community and our society more generally, and whether or not it's the church, and we think about um, how many branches there are, and why does it seem these days that every time there's a disagreement, someone is branching off and founding a new, you know, denomination, right? Like, we can't just figure this out and stay together. We've got to have this many distinct branches, and then think of all the leaves that are on those branches, right? And like, it's, it's, we get into, you know, and this is maybe something up for us to think about as well, the way that kind of so much of what we think we know these days is driven by social media, right? I mean, what I shared with you already about knocking on doors and talking face to face with people. Um, but, you know, and then we're, we're unified by this trunk of the tree, which seems really solid, um, but we neglect the roots, right? We look at the trunk, we look at the branches, we look at the leaves, and that's what we see on the surface. But it is, we're missing the most important element if we're not really paying attention to the roots and what is happening, trying our best to understand what is happening deep beneath um, the surface. So with that, I might ask you to, um, what are some of the, you know, and, and let me see where we are over time, because we have a hard stop at eight, four, at 945? Yes. Yeah, so why don't we do this? I think it's great. We can spend the next 10 minutes maybe sort of naming um, some of the conflicts that are important to you, that are on your mind, um, maybe how you view them, and, and then I can kind of take those home with me, you know, before next week. Get into those um, on a deeper level, but if we're thinking about what you know, some of the conflicts that we're seeing in the world or we're seeing in our lives, what are some of those that are most like pressing on your mind? I mean, I'll just share. Morning, in her very first communication with me, said, "Well, you know, I think some of us would probably be very interested to talk about Gaza, um, and now not just Gaza, right? We're talking about Lebanon, where you know." So that's something that I think is, is on the minds of, just in particular, Christian Jews and Muslims around the world, because we see this as the birthplace of our faiths, we see you know, some affinity towards the people. Of course, our, you know, I mean, even this question of you know, whose land is it, right, has these sort of biblical implications, right, or the other way around. The Bible has these implications on who lives there and whose land it is and all of that sort of um, stuff. What are some of the other conflicts that we're seeing in the world? What are some of the other things that are on your mind? And it can be something as mundane as, you know, they're building this thing in town and, you know, we don't want them to cut the trees down. I don't actually, I'm two towns over in Long Park and in Madison. Um, but what is happening here in your community or in our world that is a conflict that is troubling you? So uh, one of the big political issues that we see 
three of us can stay and take this integration. Mm-hmm. And I, it's, it's, it's such an emotional argument. And I wonder what the source of that all is. You can make it up, and I have my theories, but it, it's, a, it's a conundrum I don't understand. And it tears us apart. It does, and you know, that's a really great example of a problem that we absolutely refuse to address at its root, and that's why it keeps coming back. I mean, you go back 100 years in this country, that is exactly, you know, what they were arguing about, right? And it was, a, um, and, you know, they were using phrases like America first, they were talking about, you know, saying the same things about people bringing diseases, right, and taking jobs. I mean, those are the exact same rhetoric. I mean, you could probably take a piece from a New York Times article in 1924 and, you know, just kind of redact it a little bit and read it and you guys would think it was literally on the front page of today's Times. Um, And what would be really, really fascinating is to see maybe some of the same people that are, like, on either side of that at that time might be some of the same people saying the opposite now. Right, people that were immigrants um, in 1924. Um, in this case, you know, a, a really clear example at that point would be Irish folk, right, um, or Jewish folk, or people coming from um, parts of Europe in particular, right, that today see themselves as the indigenous Americans, <laughs> and how dare you come here, right? But either way, this is a problem that you know we've seen these um, because again, in, in the you know, after the civil rights era, there was, or, or actually in the middle of the civil rights era, there was also a sort of closing of things down to the 1965 Immigration Act to open things back up again. So we know that at multiple times in our nation's history, um, there has been this problem. We have never really, like, people don't, they, they get into statistics about jobs, when we did a study, immigrants contribute to the community, no immigrants are taking our job, and people can argue over all of those things, but we've never really gotten into the deeper, like, who's the immigrant? Whose land is this? Maybe we're all immigrants, right? Like, like have a big, big, deep conversation about what does even that word immigration mean? What does it mean to be indigenous? What does it mean to be foreign? What does it mean to be, right? Um, and all of that. Um, and so that's probably what we need to have is a, a, that type of national conversation, but we just haven't had that, yeah. Two, <laughs> very obviously, this thing that we're calling <clears throat> the election 2024, which is really a, a showdown between a kind of a liberal America and a mega America group. <coughs> it involved Democrats and Republicans. <coughs> the other one that I'm trying to keep faith with um, is Ukraine and Russia. I think all of these that you've mentioned so far that are kind of big ones all involve some version of what you talked about over whose land this is. Yeah, absolutely. And there again, it's it's like it comes back to that scene. You know, we like, it, it's very easy. So this would be an interesting example of how to, one of the most important principles, and I, and I think I haven't really, you know, mentioned this that much at all today, but it really is one of the hardest parts, but it's perhaps the most important part, is that can you imagine yourself in the other person's shoes? And can you imagine what is the other guy thinking? Because this for me is actually the the real, um, you know, as I'm sure you've all seen in the past year, what's happening on college campuses around America because of, you know, Gaza, right? But similarly, we'll see some of these things with the you know, this is what they're telling us about the election as well, right? That like, you just, everyone is so sure that they're standing on the solid wall ground, right? Um, that they're on the right side of history. I mean, we use that term, right side of history, which is, if you think about it, really off-putting because we don't know what history is going to look like, right? Because that in itself is a projection. You're telling yourself, I know what the world should look like, what it's going to look like, and you're the one that's messing it all up. And we don't know what's God's will. We don't know what will, what will happen. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's really funny because 
that's in uh, so now this kind of inside education stuff that I'm sharing with you. But my own personal feeling is like when we respond to criticism of higher ed, and higher ed has come under criticism generally, you know, in the past decade or so, um, is um, you know, and we respond, well, we teach critical thinking. And maybe they don't need Shakespeare, and maybe they don't need a dance class, and maybe they don't need this, but ultimately they come away with critical thinking skills. When the Gaza War broke out last year, I was like, where did the critical thinking go? Because everybody's pretty sure they know 101% what is right, and refuses to even imagine what is the other side. So I think this is, you know, clearly Putin is the big evil villain in this world, right? And clearly Ukraine is the, you know, the argument uh, of, and again, I'm not trying to take a side here, but to show how you also have to imagine. For many, it's uh, on the one hand, it can look just like a land grab. The argument that they put forward is that there are many Russian-speaking, Russian, ethnically Russian people that live um, in the demands territory, right? And so they're actually claiming that it should be part of Russia. Now, I'm not in any way taking sides here and getting into the nitty-gritty arguments, but you won't have a better conversation until you say, okay, well, the other side has something to say about this. They're not just evil, I'm good, I'm right, I'm moral, and they're the bad guy. And when we start from that position, we're never gonna have a fruitful conversation. I think of your brother saying, well, you missed that part at the beginning of the passage in Genesis. And I think in all of these conflicts <coughs> that we mentioned so far, if you invoke God, three questions. What God? A lot of your students say God? Yeah. Irrelevant. Maybe, maybe not existent. Which God? Who's God? So even with God invoked, that's not a magic bullet. Right. No, thank you. And that's really, really important. And I need to say that because, again, we're here, uh, you know, inside a religious space. Um, so how do I respond to that? And, and that's actually relatively easy because it's, can I say, don't you know what I mean, though? Because even if you don't believe in God, um, right, which, which is, we know, that many people don't have God in their lives or, or don't necessarily believe, um, there's something, you understand when a person carries themselves, that they're driven by a concern for others and compassion, because I do believe you can have all of those good characteristics, right, and, and elements in your life that drive you, even if you don't have faith, right? Um, so I, I kind of like to respond and say, okay, forget about the God part if that doesn't <laughs> work for you. But just you know what it means to enter a space as someone with an open heart, an open mind, someone that, you know, will be vulnerable, someone you can trust are being truthful with you, right? These are all really, really important things. And that was, was it, even though Abimelech and Abraham um, have very different you know, views on this, there is a mutual respect and recognition, and that is a key element to solving these things. I'm just saying we're out of time. Yes. Oh, great. <laughs> I, I would just like to say, I've been sitting here thinking of a hundred million conflicts, and so I think we need you for the rest of the year. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about right. Thank you so much. No, this is a perfect way, because we kind of think about other things that are on your mind. I mean, I, I just send you all home with the assignment, is even in your personal lives, that I have this argument with my sister, with my coworker, with whomever, and, and think more deeply about what might really be there beneath the surface, those deep roots that are driving it. And we'll come back next week. Yeah. Thank you so, so much.